Hello again. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, tonight as we think about our humanity and think about you as our creator, please will you, as always, speak to us, give us ears that hear your voice, hearts that are open to receive it, and minds that, that grasp it so that we can know you better or know you for the first time and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello humans. How are you fellow humans doing tonight? I'm doing well, humanly speaking that is. You are humans, I am human. We're all humans as we sit here tonight. It's probably the most times that I've said humans in a very long time, uh, possibly in my life, but, but we are humans. And have you ever wondered, what makes me human? Well, you wouldn't be alone. Many men and women have contemplated this throughout history. The best minds have these categories for what make us human. I think, therefore, I am. The fact that we have the ability to think through things and problems, uh, it allows us to engage with the things around us like no other creature. But what about our bodies? Surely that they also count. Humans are not just minds floating around. I can see all of you here tonight. Well, others would say that we're just glorified apes. We've descended and evolved from monkeys. More specifically, chimpanzees. We share 99% of their DNA. But don't forget, we also share 50% uh, of banana DNA too, uh, which is quite weird when you think about it. Um, in this case, our physical characteristics are at least included, but doesn't really help. Now, are we still technically under the monkey umbrella? Uh, then humans are not in their own group. That just doesn't make sense. Seems bananas to me. Others describe humanity as a supercomputer. Stephen Hawking really backed this idea. Uh, this is not so much the mind and the thinking as it is the brain. The physical brain we have as humans and all the ability it has in both thinking and doing things. Our brains are often compared to supercomputers, the way it connects, communicates, and engages with the world around it. But then where do our emotions go? What about our feelings? Why do we care so much about things and ourselves? Well, others would say our sole purpose as humans is to work, to earn as much as we can. Humans are the only creatures that seem to work and mostly get paid for it. Just a shout out to the ants who work very hard and other animals too, but sadly not for pay. Humans are then valued different by their jobs. Doctors are seen as higher in society than plumbers. But that's not true. They are still both human. And what about the lazy people? who don't work uh, for whatever reason, or those who can't work for whatever reason, are they not as human as the rest of us? And this view does touch on a true reflection of humanity. We do like to divide people and rank them as to who is more human and who is less human. And it could be regarded to your jobs, could be where you live, who you follow, it could be the school you went to, the color of your skin, the language you speak, the gender you are, the country you come from, the list is endless. And then we justify treating fellow humans as trash because we devalue their status as humans by our own status, which is terrible and ridiculous. And we are, again, the only creatures who do this. You don't see a lion coming to his pride and some of the other lions saying, sorry, Leo, don't think that you're much of a lion. Go somewhere else. You're not one of us anymore. Poor Leo looks down in the river as he drinks water and he thinks to himself, who am I? I look like a lion, I sound like a lion, I smell like a lion. He is a lion. Okay, I'm just being silly, but that is to show us how really unintelligent, to put it politely, we can be as humans. Skin color, schools, jobs, single or married statuses and so on doesn't change our status as humans or give us more or less value as humans. Well, some great minds over the years have come up with the last option. What makes us human? I don't know. Who could ever know that? We are just humans, humans are complicated, I am complicated, and I don't know why. What about you? Have you ever wondered what makes you human? Where would you fit in this thought process? The reality is we all are human. The reality is that none of these views are right. And that's because they're looking at the question from the wrong perspective. The reality is that humans, all of us, have the wrong perspective. We have the wrong starting point when we come to this question, we start with ourselves when we should start with God. Now, thankfully, we don't have to wonder how God views us. We don't have to search too far in the world. 
or in his word for that fact. It is right there in chapter 1, and it was read for us just a moment ago, but let me read it again. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What makes us human? Well, firstly, we have to see who makes us human and God does. God, our creator, makes us human. Humanity at some stage in the existence of our world and universe did not exist. We didn't exist. God did exist. In his wisdom and love, he chose to create us. Humans are creatures made by a very creative God. What makes us human and sets us apart from the rest of the creatures and the plants is that we are made in God's image. This gives us value and purpose and more specifically, a very unique closeness to our creator. All of God's creation is good and beautiful, but not all of it is made in his image. There's lots to say about being made in God's image, but what we need to see for now is that as image bearers, we reflect God's relationship and rule to his creation. This section starts with God saying, let us make man, mankind, humanity in our image. God himself is relational. God, our creator, is Trinity. Three persons, but one God. He doesn't need us because he's feeling lonely. He chooses to make us for his glory. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons in perfect relationship with each other uh, for all eternity. God makes us relational. And we see this when we are told, male and female, he created them. Humanity created in the image of God. Male and female created in the image of God. One is not less than the other. One is not greater than the other. As humans created as image bearers, men and women are equal. God loves us both equally. He respects us both equally and he makes us for each other. Different, but both equally image bearers as humans. God deliberately makes us men and women. He makes us different on purpose. That is how we will function best relationally in the creation he's made. More importantly for our topic, it's how we will function best as humans. Being male and female, or female, is not a disability. One sex is not better than another. They're equally created and find value in God, our creator. Our world seems very obsessed at the moment to change us, to blur the lines between male and female. Ironically, both extreme groups are saying the same thing. On the one extreme conservative side, they're saying pink is for girls, blue is for boys. On the opposite extreme, they are saying that if you're a boy and you like pink, then you're a girl, so become a girl. You can be whatever you like. So we let color dictate what our gender is. We let the social structures that we've set up dictate what sex we are. And then, well, we blame God. God made us male and female. He gives us so much freedom within that boundary. God never came up with the pink and blue thing. We did. Like almost every other thing we think makes you female and male other than physical attributes. What makes us human is not our gender. It is God who makes us human He literally does that. It is God who defines what makes us human. And as humans, we are image bearers of God. As image bearers, we reflect the relational aspect of our God to the world around us. We also reflect his rule to the world around us. God puts us in charge over his creation. We often think the the first and only rule that God gave us in the beginning was the negative one. Don't eat from the tree of good and evil. But the truth is, there's two rules just before that. Multiply and fill the earth, and then rule over the earth. Basically, God blesses us with everything that we need to function in this world and tells us to enjoy it and thrive in it. So what makes us human from God's perspective is that we are relational. We are made to know God personally, and we're made to know each other. That is what sets us apart from anything else in creation, personal relationship with our Creator. The fact that we're able to love God and love each other makes us human. That is how we are made. That is why we are made. Unfortunately, that all gets messed up. 
when the first humans choose to reject God's rule in their lives, they rejected his relationship with him. They hide from him. They hide from each other. A piece of our humanity is broken and lost. Relationships are broken. It doesn't change the truth that we are humans made for a relationship with the God and each other. But at the fall, humans cover up from each other and they run away and hide from God. But God comes and looks for them. He pursues them. God calls out to the humans, where are you? Obviously, he knows where they are. It's like if you've ever played hide and seek with a very small kid, they choose the silliest hiding places against the wall. I don't know what that is. Uh, behind the tiniest box that you could ever imagine. Uh, and when they go hide behind the curtain, which is actually not a bad place, uh, you can hear them laughing. So it's super obvious where they are. Yet you still ask, where are you? God knows what has happened. He knows where they are. And yet he goes after them. Unfortunately, from that day on, our relationships are broken. They're broken between humans and God. They are broken between each other as humans and can't be fixed. The damage is done. But we don't stop being human. We can still connect with God because he makes ways for us. We can still connect with each other, but it is hard. We all know what it's like to be hurt or to hurt someone else. We were made to love God with all that we have and each other as ourselves. But we can't do that now that we are broken. We can't do it in our own strength. We need help. We need restoration and reconciliation. And this is ultimately seen in the ultimate human, Jesus. Jesus the Christ, Jesus God the Son came and lived among us. Our creator, he didn't only speak to us and tell us what it means to be human. He came and he showed us what it looks like to be truly human. In Jesus the God-man, we are shown what we should look like as humans. How humanity should be reflecting our creator to the world around us. Ultimately, it's summed up in one word, love. Humans are to love God with everything and to love each other as ourselves. And we see Jesus' love for God displayed in his rejection of the devil. Jesus, like Adam and Eve, was tempted by the deceiver. Yet instead of falling for the lies, when he was asked, Did God really say, can you really trust this God? Or well, Jesus sticks to the truth. He speaks the truth. He defeats the lies with truth. Jesus shows his love for God and that he loves God with everything. And that means that he won't reject him. When confronted with something Jesus finds incredibly difficult to follow through in, uh, in his humanity, that is facing God's wrath on our behalf, we see these words from Luke 22, 41 to 44. And he, Jesus, withdrew fr from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Uh, be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus the Christ wasn't asking God to not let him die. The thing that he was dreading was the cup, the cup of God's wrath, the eternity of separation and weeping and gnashing of teeth that awaits those who reject God in this life. Jesus on the cross would feel the full weight of that. It caused him so much angst and anxiety that it caused him to sweat droplets of blood. And that only happens under extreme anxiety. Yet Jesus loves his Father above all else. And he says, not my will, but yours. In loving God, his Father above all else, he fully trusts him above all else. Jesus shows us that the ultimate human, as the ultimate human, our relationship with God is worth everything. It's vital. It gives us the right perspective. It helps us to live the best life. It reminds us who is really in charge and what is mostly important. Getting that relationship right will lead to the relationship with others. Loving God with everything will naturally lead to us loving others as ourselves. Because God loves us. God loves humans. We are loved by God. Therefore, loving God leads to loving each other. And again, Jesus takes the lead in this. Listen to these words from John 15. Verse 12 and 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That is exactly what Jesus does for us. In his love for us as his friends, he lays down his life. He dies for us. But don't forget, he willingly dies for us. He takes the initiative. He goes along with it. He could easily avoid it. He is God the Son after all. But true love means when faced with a choice to live for himself or to die for his friends, 
while Jesus chooses to lay down his life for his friends. Not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but simply because he loves us. Loving someone as ourselves does not hang on their perfection, but on our choice. I love Sharissa and Bulalani, and they have no choice in the matter. I love them. They didn't have to sign a contract to earn my love. They didn't have to buy shares in my company. I don't have one, but anyway, to, for me to love them. They don't have to work to keep my love for them. Nothing they do will ever change my love for them. I will love them until I die. Sure, they might hurt me or anger me. I might hurt them or anger them or disappoint. Might, might be get disappointed, but it's not going to change my love for them. It's a massive love that I have for them. But my love for them is so tiny compared to God's love for us. It's like taking on the U.S. military with a water pistol. There's absolutely no comparison. We see this in Jesus the Christ, the ultimate human. Jesus shows us what humanity is supposed to look like. And when we look like that, well, then we glorify God. We bring Him glory when we live lives that strive to love Him with everything and to love each other as ourselves. And once we see that, it changes everything. But we can't do it alone. And as humans, we are dependent on our Creator. We grow up trying to be independent, thinking we are independent, but we do need Him. And no surprise, God does not leave us on our own. Listen to these words um, from John 14, verse 15 to 17, as Jesus speaks to His disciples. He says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. God gives us himself. God the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. He changes us. Jesus wins among many things reconciliation for us in his death and resurrection. God the Holy Spirit lives in us and starts the restoration of our true humanity, which will ultimately be fulfilled one day when we're in eternity. Before Christ, well, we lived our own way. We live for now. We live for ourselves. We live for things that are perishing and passing away. We live for things that, are ter that temporarily fulfilled us, fulfilled us. We didn't care about God. We didn't really care about people unless it benefited ourselves. We were broken. We were heading for death. The wrath that Jesus felt was awaiting us. But now in Christ, we have God, the Holy Spirit. He transforms us. And so we should see and we do see the world differently. He transforms our words, how we speak to people around us. He transforms our actions, how we treat people physically, emotionally and mentally. He transforms our thoughts, occupies our minds. God the Holy Spirit makes us human, truly human. And what makes you human is love. God made us to love him with everything that we have, and to love each other as ourselves. That's what God tells us in his word. That is what Jesus shows us in his life. And that is what the Holy Spirit enables us to do. A life live, uh, that lived like that is a life that's worth living. A life lived like that is what brings glory to our God and creator and father. Now tonight some of us are sitting here still broken. You haven't accepted this truth for whatever reason. You're still chasing after the temporary. I oh, hear the truth tonight. This is not what you're created for. You're made for so much more. Please hear God calling you tonight. See God pursuing you in Jesus the Christ. Allow the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within you. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Turn and live for him. It's the best choice that you can make. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, as we are confronted with our humanity, both terrifying and exciting at the same time, you are so big. You are so unlike us you are eternal you're everywhere you know everything you created this incredible world and universe that we live in 
you made us with our very complicated bodies. You are very big God. And yet you choose to love us. Even though we're fallen and broken and grow up, not acknowledging you, not wanting to acknowledging you, not acknowledge you, not wanting to know you, yet you love us and you pursue us. And being the very big God, you sent your son, Jesus the Christ, God in the flesh, to live among us, to show us what it's like to be really human. He lived a life of loving you with all that he had, loving us more than he loved himself. He died for us to give us life. Help us to trust that truth, to remember that truth, and to follow that example of Jesus the Christ. Jesus, our brother, our example to follow. Help us to be humans who love you with all that we have. Humans who love each other as ourselves. Humans who live out what we were created for, to bring you glory in doing those things. Thank you for the incredible gift of God the Spirit who lives in us, who helps us to start to reflect that to the world around us. We praise you and we thank you. We're just in awe of you, our great God and creator. In Christ's name, amen. Why did God make us at all? Well, perspective is the key in understanding this question. We must start with God. At some stage, we did not exist. There's absolutely no need for us to exist. God, our eternal creator, chose to make us. And he did this out of his love and for his glory. God didn't need us because he was lonely. He wasn't feeling unfulfilled, although we are made in his image. God is not like us. We exist because he chose to make us. He had all of history in mind as he created our world because he is eternal. Although we had no, a choice, we would always rebel. Jesus, God the Son, would always need to come and die for us and conquer death, sin and the devil for us. Again, showing us God's love and glory. One day soon, we will be in eternity with God, our eternal creator. And then we will have the full perspective. For now, we live knowing, trusting and experiencing God's love for us as we strive to bring Him glory by loving Him and each other. When did I choose to become a sinner? Well, we all start as sinners at birth. Adam and Eve were able to not sin. They chose to sin. They chose to reject God's loving rule and relationship in their lives. And they are our representatives. A sinner's spiral out of control in our world today. And this is the truth. As our representatives, Adam and Eve give us insight into our own lives. Given the same set of circumstances, we would have made the same choice. Now this is important because we are not victims. God creates us and gives us choice. This, is, this gives us dignity. The truth hurts. The truth is we don't want and won't choose God on our own or in our own strength. We need help and thankfully God knew that already. Thankfully God loves us despite our rebellion. Thankfully Jesus was always going to come, God in the flesh, and die for us. Thankfully we are gifted the Holy Spirit to start the change and transformation in us now. Well, soon Jesus will return and we will be fully transformed and spend eternity with our eternal God.